Praise God. I'm so glad to be in the house. I, I tell you what, I love gathering for church. And I'm so grateful that we know we're not, we are not just, you know, this is not the whole thing. We are not just having church. We are the church. But when we get together with others who are also the church, and we come and we meet together and we tabernacle together and we talk to God and we hear from him and we worship together, there's something next level that happens. We magnify the Lord together, right? The word says, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And coming together, whether it's online, and welcome to those of you who are watching online, or whether it's in person, something is strengthened on the inside that just can't be done any other way. There's something that happens in just seeing one another. And I, I, I wish that we could, um, you know, fully get back to normal. But, you know, I think that there's some stuff that God's opening us up to in new ways. But we are grateful to be able to see one another. So just for a moment, we won't do the big, like, get up and hug one another thing. But look around you. Look at somebody in maybe the little next section to you and say, I'm really glad you're here today. I'm really glad you're here today. Everybody can find somebody. If you're sitting alone, find somebody. I'm really glad you're here today. I am really glad you're here today. Aren't you, aren't you like delighted to find out that you're the answer to some of the encouragement that some other people need? Like just seeing your smiling face is picking up somebody else today. It's something that God's put in us. And I love that we get to do this journey together, that we're growing together. And in this moment in, in history, man, the world sucks. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that was my inside voice. <laughs> but the church is awesome. I love, right? <laughs> Man, I feel like everywhere I go right now, I'm just like, you know, you're kind of just tense all the time because you don't know like how, how people are and what, who's on their last nerve and on their final straw and who's doing, you know, and, and you just kind of, you just kind of like stare down and do your thing because you just, you know, it's, it's hard right now. But you come into the house of God and we're of the same tribe. We're part of the same kingdom. And it's not that we're not still, you know, respectful of where everybody else is at, but we, we serve into it. We love into it. We know that God has called us to do life together. And so I find that such a privilege. Um, you know, again, today we're going to be talking about that, that first piece, the cornerstone. We started last week. Um, but we just need to take it a little bit further. And uh, I, I so appreciate the body because I love being able to talk about this stuff. And after the fact, people having questions or just discussions like, so what does that mean in this area of my life? Or how would I apply that here? And I realize that sometimes, you know, preachers have this, we're, we're running everything through our filter. This is my paradigm of life. And so I will bring you know, the scripture, the word, but it's going to come through my paradigm. And so however you do life, whatever situations you're dealing with, whatever relationships, with whatever struggles, sometimes it, it's not as obvious how to apply things. And so that's part of what we're doing with this building the family altar is going through in a way to identify how to apply the word of God. And the reality is we want our children to be able to pick it up. We want our youth to be able to pick it up. We all, whether you're, you've been saved for 40 years or you've been saved for four days, you know, there's an element of the word of God, an element of the gospel that should be applicable right now. And I love how when Jesus spoke, he's not complex. You know, the, the, the depth of content of what Jesus spoke was far less um, complicated than what Paul said. <laughs> so, you know, you have the, the people factor that adds on when Jesus said stuff directly, he would say things in a sentence, whereas the apostle Paul like brings it out into a paragraph to apply it to our, our lives. And so this is the place that we're at. We can go back to the simple gospel, the simple truth, and then we begin to expand it into our lives, apply it into our lives. And so the concept of the cornerstone, if you didn't get a chance to hear it last week or uh, you weren't here, please, um, please go back and listen to the message because it's going to be the starting point for everything else that kind of comes off of this. But we learned that a cornerstone originally was designed, it, it's in all the ancient buildings, um, 
you know, that the ones that are still standing, which is phenomenal. And so these cornerstones, the main pieces that were in there had four main rules. So number one, the rule was to be the starting place of the rest of the building. So you lay the cornerstone first, and from there, everything else happens. And so we're wanting to look at in our own lives when the word tells us that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He is the chief cornerstone. He's meant to be the first thing that everything else of our lives comes out of. Not an add-on, not just a, you know, a religious expression that we have in addition to our lives. It's the, co the core thing. It's the starting place. It's the, the beginning of it all. The second thing that it does is to provide measure and reference by which the other stones are laid. So we could say it in its most simple form. If Jesus is the cornerstone, then what would Jesus do? If, if Jesus is the cornerstone, it provides reference for where everything else comes in. How does Jesus see it? What does Jesus say about it? That's where everything else comes in. Rather than, this is the life I've chosen. This is what I want to do. This is how I see things. God, please bless it. Not the same at all. The third thing that a cornerstone does is it forms the base on which two walls join. So it's in that actual corner. There's two walls coming from different places, and they land and join on that. In our case, it is the joining of heaven and earth. It's the place where we live here in the natural, but we are seated together with him in heavenly places. How, do, how does that work? We're eternal beings living a temporary existence on this earth. And so the coming together happens through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. That's it. He's the place where those two things come together. And the fourth thing, a, a cornerstone is to provide stability upholding the weight of the building and that's a big deal it has to be a solid cornerstone it has to be the the one that that can can't handle the weight that's coming upon it the the nature of the building is that that main pressure point lands right on the cornerstone and it sustains the weight of the rest of the building and so these four things this is what jesus is to us this is how we're meant to live and um i you know for me again it's good to pause and dissect how this looks in regular life because to me, a lot of this stuff is just, um, it almost comes naturally. Like not, not completely, it's not that I don't struggle, but I was blessed to be raised up in a family that very specifically and deliberately laid the stones of our faith. And so there was a clear understanding. So some of this stuff, now I have to pause and go, why do I think that? And you know, walk it back and okay, yep, this is what I know about this. So it's good for us to pause and, and actually apply it because that stability that I can see that I feel um, on the inside of my life is that even though I really, really hate what's going on in the world right now, I could get very, I could lose it most days if I, if I went there. But I find, like Wayne and I were talking about this the other day, isn't it awesome when you're, everything is blowing apart, you can put on worship music and you can start just singing along, even though you maybe don't feel like it right away, you start singing along, um, you know, something, I usually do something that makes me declare who God is right off the bat, right? And, and, and within, you know, just a few minutes, you start to feel a lightness happen. And you realize that as you enter his gates with thanksgiving and you enter his courts with praise and you come before him with singing, that something changes. And so even though all of this is just straight up crappy right now, you can rise above it. And you step into that place with him where you're seated with him and suddenly clarity. Suddenly there's no blaming. Suddenly there's no accusation. Suddenly there's no pressure. There's a place of peace that is above this realm. And we step into it from this place. So we don't have to die to get there. From here on earth, we can engage his presence and find a place of safety and stability and strength for our mind from which we then do the rest of life. So that's just a practice that um, we have in our home. It's something that we do. But essentially, it's applying Christ as the cornerstone. It's saying that when all of this is broken, instead of trying to fix this, 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 I'm going to step out of it, and I'm going to allow him to be the one that carries the weight. 
I'm going to be allow, allow him to be the one that shows the direction. I'm going to be the one that steps into the place and allows him to have his kingdom come and his will done in my life on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to choose to allow him to be the starting place for my responses today because I can't trust my own. So it's just a built-in thing, right? So we want to we want to talk about if that's, that's the starting place, if Jesus is the cornerstone, how do we apply him? So we're, we're going to use the phrase setting the stone. Today, how do we set the stone? And setting the stone, you know, it's interesting because if you, if you Google it, you might have some fun this afternoon if you want to spend a little time on it. You'll find a lot of Scottish guys with a little crazy, little old Scottish guys talking about how to select the first stone and whatever, and they're, they're going on and you're like, Okay, but you know, they can build entire walls and buildings without mortar even because of the way they select the stones and the weight and the balance and what goes down first. They've got the, the skill set to know the importance of the stones in, in building things. But back in ancient days, they, you know, that first stone has to be put in the right place. Everything else comes off of it. So whatever starts a little bit crooked, you know, a centimeter off at the beginning is feet off on the other side. Like it's way off. And so they would have to make sure that that cornerstone was laid absolutely perfectly. And a lot of it was done based on, of course, your longitude, latitude. It was based on the stars and the sun and the things that were constant. We have to allow our lives to be built upon the things that are constant. Jesus is the constant. He's that place that we come back to. And so some of the questions that came up just um, basically, how can I know for sure that Jesus is my cornerstone? How can I be guaranteed? Uh, one of the best questions that somebody straight up asks is, how can I be sure I'm not my own cornerstone? That's a very good question, honestly. Some of these things, how do I, if, if Jesus is my cornerstone, he's the center of everything, how do I apply that to my work, to my family? You know, what, what does that look like in real life? Like if Jesus is supposed to be the starting point of everything, how do I find balance in my life? Well, the reality is if Jesus isn't the center, <laughs> there's no hope of balance. That's the core thing. So we're going to dig through this. And what does it look like for that stone to be set in place in our lives? And it really comes down to it. In order for us to know that Jesus is our cornerstone, we're honestly talking about who's the boss. Who's the Lord of our lives? Who's in charge? That does not land well on North American mental thinking. I am the boss of me. I can do what I want. Stop telling me what to do. This is part of why we have so much issues right now. Interpersonal stuff is everybody's so worried about themselves. These are, this is what I want. This is what I feel. This is what I get to. And, and at the end of the day, the peace comes when Jesus is the one who decides. He's the boss of your life. And so we're going to walk through three key things today that will help us in setting the stone of Jesus as the cornerstone in our life. It's a place to jump off it. I, I just straight up, walking through life, um, it's, firstly, it's a privilege to walk through life with you guys and to get to hear what's going on with you and to see what God is doing um, and to go through the hard times with you. I know there's a lot of people right now that are standing on like absolutely the tippy top edge of faith. And it's God, it's a miracle or it's nothing right now. That's a hard spot to be, but it's a great spot to be. And so um, again, tonight for Pursuit, we're gonna stand together on some of this stuff and pray for some breakthroughs. But um, it's a privilege to do this. It's a privilege to, to see how God communicates with you and how it's, it's playing out in your lives. But the other side of it is, if I wasn't 100% confident that God is able, it would crush me. Any one of you, it would, it, your, your spouse, your, the people that are doing life with you, it would crush them if they didn't know that God is enough, that God is the answer, that he's always the source, that he's the one that we run to. If you've got the answer, it's great to come alongside people that are needing an answer. If you feel like you've got to produce an answer, it's a lot of pressure. I'm 100% confident that as messed up as things are in the world today, 
it could change like this if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'm 100% convinced that if people would get right before God, the issues around us would be adjusted in a moment. And so I find great confidence in that. I feel like my job then is not to, to hate on everything that's going on. It's to make sure that I, as his person who is called by his name, am humbling myself, and I'm praying, and I'm seeking his face, and I'm turning from my wicked ways, and I'm here, that he is hearing from heaven, and he will heal my land. I just, I just look at it as I start with me. We start with our family. We start with this house. We start with what we have um, relationship with. We make sure that Jesus is that cornerstone. But right up, up close, it has to start with me. I cannot change major national policies. I cannot deal with the national budget or non-budget or never probably ever going to be balanced again budget. I can't, I can't do a thing about that, really. I can't, I can't change a lot of stuff. I can't change the policies in workplaces. I can't change, you know, some of the, the medical situations that we're dealing with right now. I can't do anything. But what I can do is I, as his person who am called by his name, will humble myself and pray and seek his. I can do that. Up close, I can decide to make sure that Jesus is my cornerstone. He's the center of everything. So number one, the thing that we need to ask is the, the, the issue of control. Who's in control of my life? Literally, the question is, who or what has control of my life? If it's me, I have a problem. If it's me, it's inevitable that things are going to fall apart. If it's God, I can be confident. And so this control issue, this is what we kind of talked about uh, Tuesday night, a Bible study. If you haven't picked up the book yet or you haven't been able to come, uh, Good or God is, is an excellent study. But it brings it right down to the basis of, is Jesus our Savior or our Lord? He's meant to be both. So the Savior side of things is Jesus came and he paid a price for us. For the sin that we committed, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He came as a savior to pay for our sin so that we could have relationship with God. Whether we live it out or not is whether we decide for him to be Lord or not. That's the difference. So when you see a lot of, you know, maybe it's like, well, I know people who are Christians and they, they have, their lives are terrible. They're a train wreck. They're upset all the time. Nothing has worked out for them. It is probable that Jesus was their savior, but he never became their Lord. And so the savior concept is, is what Jesus does for us, but the Lord is the position he holds in my life. What position does he have in my life? Is he the boss of me? And this is not something that God demands. When we say, we pray the Lord's, or the, the salvation prayer, and we lead people into relationship with Christ, my, my uh, intention, any pastor's intention, would be that this is the beginning of your walk with him. That it's not a one and done, we just prayed it, and now I just go on with my life as normal, and nothing's ever going to change, but God's just going to fix it all. My, the intention that we, we speak is that you're coming into this relationship with God and now your life is meant to be lived for him, with him. It's this great exchange that we step into. This is Christ as the cornerstone, Jesus as the cornerstone. That the part where he comes and he is the foundation of everything that we live out of, that's about lordship. Colossians 2, 6 to 8 it says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. See, that tells us that there's an actual application of Jesus in our lives. Now, some of us, you might know this again. When we're going through these building stones, we're talking about the, we need those foundation stones so that we can not only live it, but we can teach it. We can speak it. We can, we can instruct our children in it. We can share this. So the reality is, you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And I love this. The attitude of, of doing this is not like, oh, well, if I come to Jesus, I'm just going to have to give up everything good. No, no. With thanksgiving, there's something, there's a great exchange. Here's the thing. You on your own, 
I can give you a 100% certainty, you will screw up your life. It's pretty much a guarantee. I can guarantee you if you will give your life to Christ. I'm not saying it's perfect, but there's a level of thanksgiving and gratitude and joy on the inside because Jesus said, I've come that you would have life and life abundantly. So even if it doesn't look like what your, your mental picture is, it's, there's an abundance of life, a fullness of life. It's that kind of thing where you're satisfied on the inside no matter what. That is priceless. That is, that is something that is beyond measure. Verse 8, it says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So in this very scripture, Apostle Paul is laying it out and he's saying that if you're going to walk in him, you're going to have to be aware that there are two paths that will be set in front of you. From this place forward, you will have the opportunity to go into the tradition of men and the basic principles of this world or according to the laws and the principles of Christ. Meaning, I make a decision for Jesus, but I have to know that every day from now on, every part of my life, I will have a choice. There will be a fleshy opportunity, or there will be a Christ-like instruction. But I'm going to pick which one. And because we're dealing with a general population that at present doesn't know Christ, I'm believing this is changing in our nation, but at present does not know Christ, therefore... When you look around you, the, the common analysis of what you should do with your life is probably going to be the traditions of men and the wisdom of a sensual society. And so the wisdom of God, it's going to come from a different place. And you're going to have this choice in front of you at all times. And so when, when we're dealing with Christ as a cornerstone, we are choosing, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Therefore, if you're the Lord of my life, I am going to allow you to direct my steps. It means that in the choices that I make, the, the relationships that I have, the way I spend my mind, money, the way I spend my time, I'm allowing your input on it. I'm asking for your input on it. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is a choice. I don't have to... I don't have to say yes, but if I do say yes, I'm exchanging something. It's the epitome of human arrogance to say, Jesus died for me. He gave his life for me. I say yes. I say thank you. And now I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm so grateful. And yet that's what we do sometimes, right? Right? It's my choice. It's my career. It's my, I'm going to date whoever I want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move wherever I want. I'm going to live wherever I want. I'm going to spend however I want. I'm going to, you know, smoke whatever I want, drink whatever I want, do whatever I want, because it's my life. Well, not, not if you took the exchange, because it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And there's something that has been turned Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And the, uh, the literal translation for that is your rational worship. <laughs> the only rational thing to do right now is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for you. The, the word good there means of benefit. The word acceptable means fully agreeable. And the word perfect means complete. Perfect in all its ways. So if we walk that out, it says that being not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove or experience what is of benefit, what is fully agreeable, what is complete, what is the perfect will of God for you. How do I get to what is good, fully agreeable, the complete and perfect will of God for me? I have to first present my body as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, your rational worship. Here's the issue. I only have a body on this side of eternity. It means while I'm here, what I do with this body, it means the decisions I make, the places I go, the relationships I have, the people I connect with, all of that should be offered to God as an act of rational worship so that I can know and experience fully what is good, acceptable, applicable, his perfect will for me. I will not be able to experience his perfect will for my life if I intend to hang on to my rights completely and I don't want to ask him about anything. I want to live my own life and I want to live out his perfect will for me. It doesn't work that way. This sounds maybe harsh, but I I look at it as a guarantee the opposite direction. It means if I will offer my body as a living sacrifice, and I do invite him into every relationship, decision, the finances, the time, if I do invite him into those places, I will experience his good, acceptable, perfect will for me. I'm going to experience the good stuff of God if I lay down my life. So what does it mean to actually be a believer, to live Christ as the cornerstone? This. It means that having Christ as the cornerstone of my life, there is no sacred secular divide. That's, that's straight up it. There is no sacred secular divide. That's very helpful. You know, somebody, somebody asked last week, you know, how do I balance then, you know, the, the needs of my kids, my extended family, all of this stuff. I don't, it, it means that I don't have, you know, my God time, and then I go do my family time. It means that I have God in my life, and therefore, as an act of worship to him, I serve my family. It doesn't mean that I have God time, and then I go to work, It means that because I have God in my life and I invite him to lead me, I go to work as a messenger of his and I go and do it as an act of worship to him. Everything I do in word or deed, I do to the glory of God. It means that there really is, uh, I go to the gym. Okay, I, I don't have prayer time and then gym time. I have prayer time and then I take this body and as a living sacrifice, I go and I steward it well as an act of worship to the Lord. Do you see what I mean? It's literally that simple. It's, I don't have, you know, God time and I tithe 10% and the other 90% is mine. The 10% is the agreement that I have with him that he is my source and the other 90% I spend as an act of worship to him. God, what is honoring to do with your money? How, how do I spend your money? Where, where should I direct it? You'll find if you're doing your finances with God, he leads you to the best sales, the best deals at the best time, You'll find if you're doing your relationships with him, you're calling people on the day they were like, oh, I just, I was so hoping I would run into you or I just needed to hear from somebody today or I just, this is just perfect that you're actually calling me today because I, the Lord is engaged in your life in all of these things. And so this is the stuff that we get to be part of. It says, do not be conformed to this world. The word there broken down means do, do not be fashioned like following the same pattern or have union with. Isn't that interesting? To be fashioned like following the same pattern or have union with. It means that it is probable if you're living Jesus well, you know, you're not, you're not completely a freak, but you might not see things the same as a lot of people. It means that your life is not fashioned after the same. It, it means that things like, God, every day that you give me is a gift from you. Every breath that I have is a gift from you. So my career path or my retirement plan or, you know, what I, what I want to achieve in life, it is going to be best served if I pray it through with you first. What did you make me for? What am I designed for? What's your plan for my life? I don't set the timeline on this is the day that I'm going to just, you know, quit work and go do whatever. It's, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you in every day. And as long as you have breath, you have purpose. And so it's living this. I'm not conformed to the pattern of if you do really good financially, you have freedom 55. If you kind of suck at it, you have freedom 65. If you really suck at it, you got freedom 70-ish, and maybe you're just going to hope to leave. Like that, the world system blows. God's system is as long as I have breath to live as Christ, to die as gain, I'm with him at all times. Right? That's the good stuff of heaven. That's what God's called us to. So don't be conformed to that. 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed means to be changed, transfigured, and metamorphosed. So it's like the, the thing that happens with the butterfly. And sometimes I think we overuse those on Christian memes. Really. But the reality is, a butterfly starts as one thing and ends as something else. We, are, we start as one thing. We are born as sinful man into a sinful world, and our processes, our thinking, the way, the way we engage life right from the beginning is a little bit off. And so God calls us to the place by being transformed in our minds that we begin to have something else come out the other side. And so God sees something. He sees the purpose that we don't see around us. And it's, it's done by the renewing of your mind. Do you know the literal translation of that is the renovation? The renovation of your mind. Any other HGTV junkies? I just, my favorite day on any of those shows is demo day. It's like, whoa, look at that. They, they, they suddenly took out all the walls. I have no idea how the roof is standing. But doesn't it look great that you could see out the back window from the front door, you know? But imagine that God wants to come in and he wants to renovate your mind. He wants to take out the old cluttered stuff that maybe was okay, it was, it was all right, but God's going to come in and he's going to change our thinking so that it lines up with his. That happens by the washing of the word. And so God will begin to speak to us and he's going to renovate our mind. Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lusts specifically the control put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh. There's a choice that's happening here. Who has control? I like what uh, Charles Spurgeon says, when your will is God's will, then you will have your will. <laughs> when you want what God wants, it's going to happen. When, when you pray according to God's will, it's done. When you line up, you know, the, the, the uh, verse about binding and loosing, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Those, those binding and loosing verses actually mean what is already done in heaven. When you release it on the earth, you see the product of it. We need to come into alignment with what God thinks about things, what God says about stuff. We don't just do it on our will. If, if we, uh, you know, don't have an answer to prayer and we're crushed, it means that we probably were trusting trusting in the prayer and not in God. When we trust in God, we can be okay that he's working things out according to his will. And so we want to make sure that we're aligning that out. The outward flow of my life should come from the relationship that I have with the Lord in every area. So how do we apply this in every area? It's literally stopping and pausing. And the second point that we have is communication. Have I talked to God about this? Communication. If we're not talking to him, you know, and the number, how do you hear from God? God's not talking to me. Well, the number one guaranteed way. What does he have to say? It's in here. We also have the word of God that comes to us. It's the inspired word of God, the rhema word of God that jumps out at different times when God speaks to our spirit. But you can start with that. When you're practicing to learn the voice of God, you know, um, I was talking to somebody just the other day who said, you know, I felt like God said this to me and I'm really struggling with it. And I just said, that doesn't actually match God's character. I don't think it was him. How do I know that? His character is in here. So we're lining things up. The communication that we have is here. So we pray and we listen and we study and we get in the word. And when we did our marriage course this past spring, we were talking about this. There's this thing that happens, you know, in marriages where it's like, you know, we, we hate the word submission right? That, because it's been misused. But essentially, we are under the same mission, and the husband covers the wife for sure, but we can resist this, like, we can resist the, the coming together under the same mission because of pride, because I want what I want out of my life and my marriage and whatever. And so when we started talking about, you know, how much information do you share with your spouse? And literally, um, there's, a, there's a big thing in just communicating I'm going to be uh, going out tonight, if that's okay. Are you, you know, are you fine with that? Or I was thinking about buying this. It's kind of on my heart to purchase this. What do you think about that? Do you feel like we can work that into the budget? Um, I, I want to go to this game. I want to go to this conference, whatever. What do you think of that? Honestly, love 
and mutual submission, mutual honor, mutual respect, that thing, it, it comes out in our communication. If uh, you're not the boss of me and you don't need to know, means this marriage is not going to last, <laughs> pretty much. If I, if I share it with you, it's not even necessarily because I'm asking permission. It's because I care what you think. It's I want your input. I want your thoughts. I will literally say to Wayne in all kinds of ways, I'll be like, I'm really worked up about this. This is what happened. This is what they said. This is how I feel. What am I missing? And he knows me better than I know myself most of the time. And so he'll be like, well, <laughs> I, either he gets, you know, fully defensive and he's on my team and whoo hoo Or he'll be like, well, I think you actually fell off the rails here a little bit because I think when they said that, they probably meant this. And you're filtering it through this. Oh, okay, right? So because I care about him, because I love my husband, I share these things with him. I converse with him. We talk about stuff. We engage about stuff. If I say that Jesus is the cornerstone of my life, but I don't talk to him about my stuff, he's not. That's the truth of it. I can date whoever I want. I can go out with whoever I want. They looked really good when I swiped this direction. No, did you pray about who God has for you? Did you ask him who you should be with right now friendship houses the word tells us that god has chosen the exact places of our the boundaries of our dwelling places i don't we don't we don't even begin to consider moving if god doesn't tell us to we don't purchase a house unless we pray it through first health decisions you know yes ask your doctor before starting any program or whatever but also ask god he made your body he knows how stuff works. Your finances. Well, the financial advisors say this and this and this, and there is wisdom for sure. But also, God sometimes tells you to sow into unnatural fields for an unnatural harvest. And so asking God about your finances, the things of, of, of his life, what should I do with my day, my time, my holidays, you know, whatever. Are we talking to him about it, the actual communication side? Luke 5, 16 says, because Jesus modeled this for us, it says he often, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. He himself often withdrew. He went into these places daily. There was times when people, you know, the disciples came and they said, everybody's looking for you. Where were you? I'm praying. Let's carry on. He didn't care that everybody was looking for him. He was pursuing God. He was pursuing his father. Um, the, the communication that we experience from him shows up in things like John 5, 19 and 30, when Jesus says, it says, this, Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. I can of myself do nothing. This is verse 30. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. This crossover here, you see Jesus himself, fully God, fully man. Jesus spent daily time with his Father. Why? Because he's like, I actually don't want to do what I want to do. I want to do what he wants me to do. I'm only going to do what he tells me to do. And I know that that sounds super weird. Like for some people, it's like, so seriously, you pray about like what to have for breakfast or whatever. Maybe you need to, I don't know. But I, generally speaking, it's just inviting God into your life on a regular basis. I believe Jesus didn't start any day without instructions from the Father, without time and peace. There are things when God gives us a direction and he, he sets us on a path, and basically it's, it leans more into like he'll let us know if we steer off. We don't need to, like every step we don't pause, you know, we start on the path, but we go like, Father, I thank you that you have instructed me in this day. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are my wisdom and my guide. And if I'm going off in any way, I ask that you would just catch me up on it, that you would let me know. I thank you for your wisdom and your counsel. And I'm aware of him all the time. I'm alert with him all the time. Some of the prayers that we overhear uh, that Jesus prayed, we don't know many of them. Most of them we just know he went off by himself to pray. But the ones that we do overhear are all about the will of the Father. And the most prominent one is the Garden of Gethsemane, right? When Jesus is literally saying, I don't really want to do this. If there is any other way this can happen, that would be great. No? Okay. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This is the relationship that he had. This is the relationship that he modeled for us. It's a laying down of your will and a picking up of God's will. When you don't know what to do, you know, I was talking to somebody again the other day just about that, well, we're going to have to come up with a solution for this. And I've learned sometimes some things don't come as quickly to me as other things um, do. And I, I'm a doer. I'm a getter done person. I'm a problem solver. When there's a challenge, I love it. It's like, great, let's solve this. I've learned that I'm not doing so well at that when there's like nine million problems and challenges all at the same time. It's getting harder and harder to find a solution. And I have learned slowly, but I'm getting there, that if before we even begin brainstorming a solution, we will pause and ask for counsel and wisdom, there's not a lot of brainstorming that has to happen. The answer just sort of, comes. I can grind it out for days and we can come up with something that will probably work or we can in peace go, okay, God, you already knew that this situation was going to happen. You already knew this person was going to do this. You already knew this was going to happen with my job. You are ahead of me in this. So Lord, today I quiet myself before you. I come into your presence. Your word says that if we lack wisdom, we ask for it and you give it. And so God, today I'm asking for your wisdom. I'm asking for a game plan, a strategy that I can step on. And Lord, I'm just going to sit here in your presence and be still and know that you are God. You're in charge. I'm giving you the reins. Lord, give me the direction. I'm not going to move until I hear from you. In that is a level of peace that just allows me to go about the rest of my day. In the I'm going to come up with a plan, I may not sleep for a few days. <laughs> Nobody's going to like me on the end of a few days of grinding that out myself. It's the thing that God calls us into, the daily constant communication. There's different approaches to this. So just to give you a couple ideas, Smith Wigglesworth, who is like the guy who saw people raised from the dead and all kinds of crazy, crazy miracles. He said, I don't often spend more than half an hour in prayer at one time, but I never go more than half an hour without praying. So his, his method, he didn't sit there and just like, I, I'm can't minister to anybody. It was just constant. The constant flow with the Lord was how he lived. And so your personality, that might be the more uh, beneficial way for you. But then on the flip side, Martin Luther said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Different approach. I think sometimes it's, it has to do with how our brains are wired. Some people are more box thinkers and some people are more, you know, spaghetti thinkers and whatever. So if you, if you need to separate things slightly differently, if it needs to be a focused thing, do that. But always know that when you leave the prayer room, God goes with you. You're never absent of his presence. But you might be the kind of person that you sit there and in 15 minutes of just focused prayer, you're like, I'm going to lose it. I've, I've, I've thought about what we're having for dinner for the next three nights. I've thought about, did I clean the cat litter? I've thought about, I'm barely focusing. Maybe you need to find a different way. Some people find that, you know, they just need to go for a walk. They need to get out of the house, away from technology, and they pray better on their feet. And if that's the case, even in your house, some people pray better by pacing. And so do that. Find the thing that works for you, but you're in communication. So you want to stay focused on him in whatever way that is. If it's a chunk of time, then block the chunk of time, but honestly guard that chunk of time. Nobody else, unless somebody is like lost a limb, nobody should have input into your time with the Lord. That's your booked off time. Focus on him. The communication though is everything. It shows us who he is in our lives. The apostle Paul modeled for us again, another place where this, this constant communication totally works. Acts 13, 1 to 3, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna read it right away, but um, Acts 13, 1 to 3 talks about the disciples or the apostles first gathering together. It says they fasted and prayed, and they were to seek in the Lord. Imagine you've been left with the evangelization assignment of the world. Jesus left the earth, go into all the world, preach the gospel, you know, do all the stuff. How do we do that? We don't read a lot of places in the gospel where there was an actual action plan, a vision cast, you know, the, the block down of the one, three, five year plan, none of that. So they, they walked it out, out of relationship. And it says that at the end of this, they fasted and prayed, and then they sent off certain people to their assignments. And so the apostle Paul is one of the ones that gets sent off. He's sent. And so Acts 16 
6 to 10 talks about, Paul just talks about the places that he's been and the places that he wants to go. And it's very interesting because he'll say, I was here and I couldn't go there. He says specifically, I was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach in Asia. I was not permitted to go to Bithynia and I was sent to Macedonia. So what did the Apostle Paul pray about? Literally all of his travel plans. What we read about in Acts uh, 13 is that he was sent. What we find out down the road is that along the way, he had to make pivot points. He thought, I should go here, but the Holy Spirit said, no, not yet, and sent him over here. And then he thought, well, because I'm going here, I can go here. And the Holy Spirit's like, no, not yet. And, And pivots him way over here where he wasn't planning on going at all. The Apostle Paul was living constantly in the council of heaven. This idea, if we can embrace that, if we can embrace the idea that our lives are meant to be lived in that kind of a relationship, where we pivot, we're willing to change, our plans are subject to change, where literally we can go ahead and and plan, but we're doing it with the Lord, we're walking it out with him. Uh, Dixon Haas said this, and I, I think this is really helpful. The man who does not learn to wait upon the Lord and have his thoughts molded by him will never possess that steady purpose and calm trust, which are essential to the exercise of wise influence upon others in times of crisis and difficulty. This guy was a missionary in China. He, he was living this straight, you know, up, up close and personal. The man who does not learn to wait upon the Lord and have his thoughts molded by him. Like, what do you hear when you, when you hear that? to have his thoughts molded by him. It goes back to we are being transformed by the renovating of our minds. The renovating of our minds means our minds are being molded to line up with the will of God. It says that he will never possess the steady purpose and calm trust, which are essential to the exercise of wise influence upon others in times of crisis and difficulty. We want to bring the answer. We, we carry the answer. We know that Jesus is the answer. How do we deliver it? If we are not in alignment with the thoughts, the plans, the intentions of God, we will lack the confidence and the calmness and the ability to actually carry it out when it's needed. So God's just, just, just teaching us in this moment. He's discipling us to learn to live in that constant relationship with him. How do we know it works? Because as I said, Acts 16, 6 to 10, the apostle Paul takes these detours. He ends up in these different places. In fact, let's just read it so you can, you can catch it up front. I don't think I've pulled it on the screen, but Acts 16, you can, you can hear how it works for the apostle Paul. Starting at verse 6, Now, when they had gone through uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas and had a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he'd seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. There's this radical shift in plans because God has spoken to them, this is what I want you to do. Now, what we just read in this quote, this person who does not have his thoughts molded by him will never possess the steady purpose and calm trust, which are essential. So the third thing that we're going to talk about today and just finish up with this one is confidence. That steady purpose and calm trust is essentially confidence. I don't have confidence to actually share the gospel, to live the gospel, to do the right thing if my mind has not been molded by what has come, what what God has spoken to me, that relationship that I have with him, if I haven't given the full reins in the first place. It's interesting because the Apostle Paul was really clear right off the get-go. He called himself a bondservant of Christ. He was like, I am his. He's absolutely, my life is his. I belong to him. Wherever I go is where he's sending me. I'm only doing what he tells me to do. He was very focused in this. But we see this level of confidence and, and really, one of the things that we talked about, the cornerstone is to provide stability, upholding the weight of the building. A real cornerstone can bear the weight. If you read a little further in Acts 16, you find this, starting at verse 16. Now it happened, 
As we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of division met us, divination met us, and brought, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Anybody exceedingly troubling their city right now? And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitudes rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And then when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanded the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Wait a minute. We totally just read that the apostle Paul had given his life to Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. He, he'd been praying, we're going to go this way. The Holy Spirit says, no, you can't. So they go this way, and they, they carry down that path a bit. The Holy Spirit says, no, not that way. So they go the other way. They have a dream. The Lord tells them that they need to go to Macedonia. They go exactly where he sent them, and this happens. How do you deal with this happens? In our basic North American culture, this would tell us we obviously misheard God failed us. Something awful has happened. Christianity doesn't work. I thought I was doing God's will, and look what has happened to me. But Paul doesn't waver in his confidence. He doesn't move in his confidence. In fact, when we read a little bit further down, but at midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Why were they doing that? Because it was their custom. This is where they had come from. This was the foundation. The communication was in place, right? They were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep, and seeing the prison doors opened, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, what do you think God's more concerned about? It goes on and it says that, uh, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. See, there was a major kingdom plan at play. Paul could have been completely rattled by what was going on, by the bad things that were happening. As believers in this hour, I believe we have to move into that level of steadfastness that even if it looks bad because... I'm built on the rock of Jesus Christ. He is, he is in charge of my life. I have given him control. Because I'm in communication with him and I have asked him where to be, when to be, how to be, I'm doing the best I can to walk in his guidance and counsel. Even if it looks bad for a little while, I'm okay. Because I know that God is still on the throne. Even if it gets a little uncomfortable for a little while, I'm okay because I know God is still on the throne. I believe God is calling the Canadian church in this hour to grow up a little bit. We have to not freak out every time something hard happens, right? We have to learn that God is stable. He's the cornerstone of our lives. If we're in that communication and he's leading us, it is going to be good. Paul was confident. He knew what to do. He was able. See, we'll say things like, you need to praise in the storm. I guarantee you that would not have been Paul's go-to had he not already built his life on Jesus Christ, had he already not been in relationship. It was a practice of his. When in doubt, do what you do. And he did what he did. He, he, he had learned. I mean, the Apostle Paul lived the ultimate terrible ministry life. I mean, he was beaten flogged, shipwrecked, the whole bit. And he still, he could praise in the storm. 
It was his lifestyle. And out of it, we see an entire household, which then became the church in that area, saved in a moment. It was the one of the most radical, awesome, you know, prison breaks in history. We all want the radical prison break, but we don't all necessarily want to praise in the storm. We all want the radical prison break, but we're not all necessarily willing to ask God where to go and pivot our plans as necessary. We all want the radical prison break, but we don't necessarily want to allow God to be the boss of our lives. We don't want to give him control. And it's a package is what I'm telling you today. Jesus as savior and a, you know, happy wishing thing that I can do at the start of my day. God bless my day, bless my kids, bless my stuff. You know, thank you, Lord. It's not the same thing as I live my life for you. You gave my life, your life for me. I live my life for you. Paul had confidence because he was in the center of God's will. He was confident that he was. God will not lead us somewhere that he will not sustain us. Philippians 4, this is the Apostle Paul's writings. 4, verse 6 to 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He was saying straight up, it's not just, you know, stay in peace. Just stay in peace. Keep your peace. No, give it to God, and his peace will guard you. He's saying that there's this exchange that's happening. We take our stuff, and we give it to him. He says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you know the context of that? We'll, We'll say that verse, and we just toss it out as believers all the time. This is so helpful for us to look at context. Philippians 4. So verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we'll say that to people, right? Well, you're a believer. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Everything is possible. You're sustained in him. Okay. But leading up to it, it says, Verse 10, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He's saying, I'm so committed to Christ right now that when things are good, I'm with him. When things are bad, I'm with him. And I I know that the circumstances are not great, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's this place of stability, this place of maturity that he engaged in. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness or self-centered. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The confidence comes because of the relationship. The confidence comes. See, I can't cherry pick these verses. I can't just say, I will not fear what can man do to me. I can't cherry pick it. It's built out of relationship. I will not fear what men can do to me because I'm confident I'm held in his hand. Because I'm in that relationship with him. Because my trust is in him. Another one of our favorites, Romans 8:28 And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So we we've covered this in the asking him in the communicating with him we find out what is his good is pleasing his perfect will. We find out his purpose in that conversation. And I know that if I'm walking in his purpose for me, he will work it together for good. It doesn't just mean that every bad thing that happens in humanity and upon the earth, God works it together for good. Some stuff is just demonic and satanic and evil. But for those who love God and are walking in relationship with him, according to his purpose, according to what his will is for our lives, we're in that place of engaging with him. We know that whatever thing happens, God will work it out for good in us, for us, through us, that there's going to be an exchange that happens. So these things basically, 
lead us to verse 31 of Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? And that's the place that God's taking us to. This is the cornerstone, right? I'm going to have the worship team come. This is the cornerstone that God's calling us to. I am just like, I know that this church is doing really well. This group of believers, you have, you have, um, man, you have stood well. These last 19 months have been brutal. It's been a hard time. You have stood fast. Sometimes it's hard, though. Sometimes we need to, uh, you know, reevaluate why we're even standing, or if we're feeling shaky, make sure that we establish what's necessary to stand. And sometimes it's when we're dealing with the people around us, the situations around us, and people just tell you that you're crazy. One form of wisdom is eternal. One is temporal. Stick with the eternal. These things, these principles of God, these are real. This is how he operates. This is how he, he engages the earth. This is how we experience his kingdom come and his will done on earth as it is in heaven. We have to decide to let him have control. It's a choice. It's optional. We choose to allow him to be the Lord of our lives and not just the savior of our eternity, right? The Lord of my life. I choose, I choose to let you be the boss. The sense in that is that he made you. We, we claim, you know, Psalm 139, we, that he knit us together in our mother's womb, that we are perfectly and wonderfully, fearfully made. That my soul knows very well that he wrote the book of my life, the pages of my life. Doesn't it make sense to let the author instruct the life? I mean, he knows, he knows how it goes. He knows, the, he knows the plans that he has for you. Right? We claim it. Jeremiah 29, 11. We know that he, he, he knows the plans he has for you. Plans for good and not for evil. Not to harm you. To give you a hope and a future. We know this. And yet sometimes we're so resistant to let him have control. It doesn't make a ton of sense. So God's inviting us into this place where literally we're so completely sold out for him so completely spent on him. God, anything is up for grabs. Any, any spot of my life, anything that I've been hanging on to, God, it's yours. Every relationship, every dollar, every debt, every decision, I'm bringing it to you. And Lord, forgive me for neglecting the conversation with you. If I only talk to you about certain things, you know, some of us are very good. I plead the blood of Jesus. I pray protection over us as we go today, but we don't ask him where to go today. Right? It's these up close and personal things. Lord, I invite you into this life. Would you dialogue with me? Would you help me learn? Jesus, you said to come and learn from you. I want to have this conversation with you. Teach me your ways. I want to talk to you about every day. I want, to, I want to talk to you before I react. I want to talk to you before I respond. I want to talk to you before I freak out. I want to talk to you first. I want to get your opinion before I get anybody else's opinion because you're my cornerstone. I care about what you think more than I care about what anybody else thinks, Lord. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to have confidence that because you've led me, because you're guiding me, because I've talked to you about it, I'm going to do the best I can. And I thank you, Lord, that your word says that you will guide me with your eye. You will whisper in my ear, this is the way, walk in it. You're not going to allow me to stumble or fall. You're not going to allow these evil things to come near this dwelling place. You're going to be exactly what you say you'll be when I let you be it. And I'm going to be confident in that. And even if it looks bad for a little while, if it looks worse before it looks better, the Apostle Paul went through beating, stocks, imprisonment for the sake of the most radical prison break of all time. I want to see people set free. See, Paul wasn't just concerned about his freedom. He was concerned about all those around him. Some of us have friends, family members, co-workers that you know they need Jesus. You know they need freedom. Their best chance of experiencing it is experiencing it through your life of freedom, your life of trust, your life of peace, your life of confidence, your life of relationship. 
Let's stand together this morning. Lord, today we thank you. We thank you for being the cornerstone. We thank you that, Father, you said that you lay a cornerstone in Zion. You, you lay that stone. You establish it. We thank you that the word tells us again and again that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the place where we build our life upon. He's the strength. He carries the weight. He points the direction. He puts everything else in place. It's a building that is sustainable. We're being built up as your workmanship, God. And so, Lord, today I thank you that you're just teaching us how to live that out, how to, how to um, verbalize it, God, how to teach our children, how to live it out in our families, how to teach our, our friends and family who might ask God how to experience you up close and personal. Lord, I thank you that you offer us the, the freedom of, of experiencing you as the one who controls our life, who directs it, who directs our steps, who's in charge, but you give us the choice to go there or not. And so, Lord, today I thank you for helping us to make that choice. Any area that we've kept hidden away in the, the building of our lives, if there's been rooms, there's been closets and doors that have been closed off to you, I pray that even today you would help us be willing to open that up that there's nothing hidden. There's nothing that you can't handle. There's nothing that you can't deal with. And Lord, I pray that you help us in our conversations with you. I thank you that you teach us how to speak with you, how to hear your voice, how to have that dialogue that's give and take. It's, it's um, a release that comes out of us and it's a receiving that comes from you. Lord, I thank you that you teach us the best ways for us, but that at all times and in all things, you never leave us, you never forsake us. So God, whether it's in chunks of time or it's just constantly throughout the day, Lord, you're with us and help us to remember to have the conversation. And Lord, help us to stand in the confidence that we have in you. Even when it's shaking, even when it's hard, even when it feels like it's been too long, even when it feels like the answer is delayed, we thank you that there's a bigger purpose, that there's a bigger plan. And when we're called according to your purpose, you do work all things together for good. And so we trust you in that today. Lord, I thank you for stability in this house. I thank you for stability in these people today. Lord, both in the, in the building and online, I thank you for establishing a stability with you as the cornerstone. And Lord, we thank you for it. We pray that you would work in us for your good pleasure. And we thank you for it today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.